Hello friends and patrons, welcome to another Ono Henry time lapse video. If you don't know what this is all about, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't, this is the byproduct of a passion project I'm working on over at Patreon. You see, many years ago, some 15, 20 years ago, in the early aughts, I used to draw these silly cartoons disguised as uh, cartoons of monsters disguised as everyday objects trying to eat children. The monsters were both uh, very good at camouflage, but uh, also incredibly bad at their job. And um, I haven't decided if these are different monsters trying to eat different, almost identical children, or just one unfortunate child surrounded by the world's most incompetent monsters. But back when, when I drew, back then, when I drew them, um, both the digital drawing technology and my own skills were pretty low. In the intervening years, the technology for digital drawing and, and the software have obviously moved forward in leaps and bounds. My own drawing skill, well, I'll leave that up for you to decide. But scratching away at the back of my mind was always the idea that I should go back to those panels, to those little doodles, and develop them into artistically sound, nice, high-quality images that I could put together in a book. I've always been partial to the idea of a comic book splash page or a cartoon as an artwork. A bit like a guitar solo, it's always so nice that when you're reading a graphic novel, they just spend uh, a page or two just drawing for the love of drawing to create characters, to create scenes. I'm sure you all remember uh, the wonderful work of the incredibly talented and marvelously skilled uh, Bill Watterson in these Calvin and Hobbes series. And the sheer joy we had at discovering those beautiful panels of the forest and hills. Now, I am nowhere near Bill Watterson's um, caliber, and I don't think I needed to tell you that, but I enjoyed the idea of it. And that's some of what is animating my, my uh, passion for this particular project. Fast forward to 2020 and my discovering of Patreon, uh, which seemed to be the perfect vehicle to make this dream possibly into a reality. So I created a Patreon page where I started putting up some of the comics and trying to draw funds to put together in a book and uh, individualized little drawings, which I would then send to the various patrons. Um, if you're interested in supporting me in this passion, uh, in this passion project, uh, come on over to patreon.com forward slash Ono Henry, that's uh, Henry with an I, uh, link in the description below. Anyway, uh, a few weeks, months ago, one of the patrons mentioned how much he would love to see a time lapse video. I was reluctant at first, but I tried it and I liked it. I, I love to see the drawing just emerge in front of me, um, which <laughs> is just it's so, there's something so enthralling and so, um, so hypnotic about it. And I decided to ruin it by rambling nonsensically over it for uh, the entire duration of the time lapse video. This is why we can't have nice things. And that, of course, brings us to now you watching this video, me talking over it and discussing some thoughts about art, about uh, artwork creation, about the drawing and painting process. Now, just so you have a little bit of an idea of my credentials, I'm mostly a in real life painter. I've exhibited uh, a fair amount, although I have nowhere near international or even national fame. I, it just gets me by. I, um, but I also teach drawing quite a bit. And um, the, the, the process, especially drawing for, for true beginners, um, because I firmly believe that everybody and anybody can learn how to draw. Drawing and painting and all the art creating things are skills that you can learn, just like every other skill you've learned. It's just we've, um, I think, been lied to about the idea that we have talent. The number of people that come to me and says, oh, no, I can't draw. I can't even draw a stick man. But yet these are the same people that as children were drawing endlessly for hours on end. That skill isn't gone. 
And the need to draw and paint is innate to human beings, I believe. It's not just a thing that we do. I think it is as fundamental to who we are as human beings as drawing and walking upright, I mean, as walking upright and using our thumbs. Now, let's, um, let's actually focus a little bit on what's happening on the screen in front of us. One, uh, one of the first things that some of you may have noticed is that the medium I'm using here is very different from the soft pastels and dry medium that I was so enamored with in the last video. I, um, I said that I wouldn't go back and I absolutely loved it and now I have completely changed. Um, because I was playing around, I, I love playing around and discovering new brushes and new approaches and playing and, and testing out the different parameters. And I fell in love with the soft vine uh, pencils overlaid with oils because both of them, like charcoal and oil in real life, they tend to pick up the underlying colors. And so you get this, this sort of muddy, um, these, these kind of muddy and varied colors that offer quite a bit of richness, texture and patina to the shapes. I love nuanced color palette and, and, and a sort of dirty color. To me, in, in the real world, there are very few areas of, you know, pure color. They do exist, but they tend to be the exception, not the rule. I would never have arrived at this discovery, though, if I hadn't been playing around exploring and discovering. If, uh, if I have one bit of advice in this video, especially to those of you who are just learning to draw or paint or haven't even tried or picked up a pencil in years, it's ne to never underestimate the power of play. Play with your medium, mess around, try different things. Even those of you who are drawing digitally, play with the parameters of your brushes. Explore and see what they can do. Those parameters and all those windows and that programming that went into it are there for a reason. In real life, you would be surprised how many ways they are to apply paint to a canvas. You know, in my day job, I, I actually run an, uh, an art store. And one of the things that I see so often is people go and buy big expensive canvases, they go and buy expensive paints, and they fall into what I call the big expensive canvas syndrome. They haven't become acquainted to their paintbrushes, to their oils, to the canvas. They don't know what their medium can do. And they think through sheer luck, willpower, I don't know what they're expecting, that their, the results are going to be exactly as they foresaw. And of course, as anybody who's painted will tell you, the artwork always has a mind of its own. And it will impose certain restrictions, certain ways of painting, certain ways of seeing, which are unexpected. And until you become familiar with it, until you have that real relationship with your medium, it's going to frustrate you nine times out of 10. And these people then end up being frustrated because obviously their artwork is not coming out like they imagined it. Do you know how little time it would have taken for them to come right, to have spent 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of each painting and drawing session, just warming up, just warming up on a little side canvas of just, hey, what happens with this red? What happens um, if I just, uh, you know, uh, apply it with, uh, with a comb or a sponge? Uh, how long does it take to dry? How well does this brush work? You know, all of those things. And the same is true for digital work. And incidentally, I wholeheartedly recommend that everybody who is a real life uh, artist to try digital work. And for all digital artists to try real life work, there is such overlap. There are so, there are such different ways of approaching artworks, but they all, they both teach their, their, own particular lessons and it, that it is so worthwhile to do a bit of both. So anyway, mess around, spend some time warming up. You know that the first 10 minutes uh, of your of your art making process is going to be a, a mess anyway. So why do it on the big important canvas? You know, when you show up at work, 
you don't necessarily dive straight into work. You're going to have your cup of coffee. You uh, you warm yourself up mentally. You're going to sit through, look through your emails, maybe have just one or two meetings to plan out your day. Do the same with your artwork. Why on earth would you just throw yourself in and think, okay, without any warm-ups, any preparation, any forethought, I'm going to produce a perfect artwork now. Warming up not only is great for your mental and physical preparation and acquainting you to your medium, but it is a way to force yourself to discover new techniques and new tools and new approaches to your repertoire. You never know when you're going to need them. Your art making skill is a bit like um, a house toolbox. At first, all you need is a hammer and some nails for some straightforward DIY projects. But a bit later, you need some screws and uh, therefore you need to get a screwdriver and then not just the flathead, but you're also going to need the Phillips and then some glue and some clamps and then a ratchet here or any, a ruler there. And then maybe you'll get a drill and some spanners. And after a while, you're going to have a complete toolbox and maybe even a workshop. And there are very few jobs that you can't handle. Settling on a single technique and a single tool is a bit like trying to fix every problem with just a hammer and nails. Sure, it can cover a lot of ground, but it's going to do some jobs very, very badly. And it never does other jobs quite as well as other specialized tools. So unless you're actually going out and exploring and looking for new DIY jobs to do and building up that tool set to do those DIY jobs properly, you're going to have, you're, you're going to be stuck with a, a, an impossible choice. Either you're never going to do those jobs and just stick to the one or two things that you know how to do well, or two, you're going to do all those other jobs badly. So same with art and, and, and drawing and, and, and uh, image making. If you're, not, if you're not pushing yourself to try out different things, to explore new ways of making images and of rendering, if you're just sticking to one or two techniques that you know work well, then you're going to slowly narrow your world into either those things, only those things that you know how to do, or you're going to fall on your face every time you venture out of that comfort zone. And to me, like I said, it, I think it's an impossible choice because developing the skill and finding a love of learning something new to me is its own reward. Not only that, but learning and activating the brain and exploring is a way of keeping alive. It's a way of making sure that you are still engaged in the world. And to me, that's a, that's a very important thing. But this talk of toolbox, and I hope the analogy didn't get away from us all too much, but uh, talking of toolboxes, it kind of touches on something I want to talk about here, which is the subject of talent. You see, the way I see talent, it's, uh, it's a bit like being handed a toolbox with, already with one or two tools in it right from the get-go. So it's inheriting a house with some DIY to do and a few tools. It puts you at a huge advantage um, from everybody else because you get to tackle certain jobs faster and better than everyone else. But it's a trap because it won't only get you so far. And very often, talented people some, uh, don't expand their toolbox. They become over-reliant on what they have and slowly fall behind. I've seen it so many times in uh, teaching people how to, how to draw and paint. And in my own encounters uh, in, in, in galleries and in the art world. The people that make it, the people that do something significant, are never those that just rely on their talent and just coast. They are always those that um, have grit, determination, that push themselves to get down and draw and put in the hours and the weeks and the months and the years. Practice and skill development is not sexy. It's not something that we show often, especially in the art world. We tend to be so overly focused on the final product, but it is so important. To me, it is more important than the final product. 
Don't shortchange yourself. Do that. Do draw every day. Draw for 10 minutes every day. It doesn't have to be a long time. It's just like gym. It might not be fun, but you know it's worth it. You know you should do it. So every day, just pick up something in real life and draw it. The drawing doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to show anyone. In fact, I recommend that you don't show anyone because it's a drawing for you. You are learning how to draw. You are learning a way of seeing the world and translating that, that what you're seeing into scribbles and mark, marks. This is the surest way to learn. Nothing beats it. I promise you. People often come to me and go, well, how can I learn how to draw? And the only way to do it is just to do it. Pick up simple objects. Pick up an apple, an egg. Don't start by drawing a landscape and a, and a dragon and a, and a car. Start small and work your way up. Observe how light is affecting that object. How to get your proportions right. How to get your, your structures right. How to simplify the shape into basic forms. Explore, play, practice, repeat. So let's think a little bit about what we're doing when we're making an image. I'm going to exclude sculpture here for a little bit because with sculpture you're actually making an object. But this applies very much to drawing and painting and two-dimensional works. What we're doing is kind of miraculous. It's a kind of magic. Uh, Q Queen soundtrack. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a head, an, an idea out of my head, okay, into your head by scratching uh, bits of carbon onto a piece of paper. And through that process, your brain and your eyes are going to interpret those scratches, those little marks, those scribbles into something that they can recognize. Oh, that's an apple. Oh, that's a cup. Look at this drawing that's currently just um, slowly emerging and appearing in front of you. At the end of the day, what are we looking at? We are looking at a conglomeration of pixels of different tonalities and colors, which there's no umbrella, there's no sea, there's no cloud, there's no kids. It's just a random assortment of, of forms and, and, and shapes and, and, and color blobs and tonal blobs. But I'm counting on those blobs being in such organization as for your brain to interpret it and put it together in a, in a meaningful way. And to me, that's very special. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I think exploring your medium and your approach and, and constantly playing with new tools is so important because you never know when you're going to discover a new and better way of getting an idea across to your viewer. It also underpins the importance of composition. I cannot stress this enough. So many people and so many of the kids that I teach just draw the object in front of them without any consideration to composition. To me, composition is key because it's the only way that you as the artist get to control and guide and help the viewer across your picture. You're deciding what is important to them when they look at it and in what order they see everything. It's a way of making sure that you can curate the visual experience. I can tell you that you can get further with a badly drawn but well composed image than a well drawn and badly composed image. So all this to say that you need two pillars. You need a pillar of play and exploration and a willingness to go into uncharted territory and the development of hard skills that allow you. So it's, it's always structured play. It's not just messing around for the sake of messing around, but it's messing around with a very clear goal in mind of getting better and better acquainted with your medium. You know, there is a local artist, a fantastic man with more skill and art knowledge than I could ever uh, hope to attain. And he once said to me, and I'm paraphrasing here, that art is like going to the toilet. If it's too loose, it becomes diarrhea. If it's too tight, it's constipation. Um, 
art sits perfectly well in that in that midpoint um he he has many incredibly witty little little saying i remember we were um looking at an, an exhibition one one afternoon and he looked at me and he said that painting looking at that painting is like having a wasp living my ear i will never forget that um anyway i'm getting off the topic all this to say try and stay in a playful and exploratory mindset for as long as possible not just when you're practicing and sketching and working up your skills but in the development of your artworks too this gives the uh, opportunity for happy accidents to happen and allows for the natural process of art making to lead you rather than you hammering and prescribing a particular uh, end result all right so let's talk a little bit about what we're actually seeing in front of us here um, so in the time lapse so far you can see the process that i've been following for this image at least um, I sketched out the main elements. I kept them in three separate layers, basically the background, the umbrella and the kid. Um, keeping an eye towards the overall composition and arrangement of the elements. I think you saw right in the beginning, I was using the layout grid to make sure that the image was relatively well composed. I shifted some stuff around, but the, the, the main elements were there. I then blocked in the major shapes in a local-ish color um, and overlaid those colors with uh, a dry uh, <clears throat> dry medium i think it was a conte or a dry pastel uh, picking up and giving a little bit of variety and life to the to the shapes so that they just weren't these flat colors and just had a little bit more nuance and variety I then, once I was happy with that more or less, I then overlaid two layers of shadows uh, using the multiply uh, layers. The first one to develop the shapes into forms and to separate my light and dark families as Marco Bucci calls them. Incidentally, if you don't know the YouTuber uh, and artist Marco Bucci, I wholeheartedly recommend him. His, um, his videos on drawing and painting are superb, superb. Anyway, um, so uh, with the multiply layers, I basically created um, ambient shadows and then direct cast shadows. I then obviously gave all the shadows a little bit of variety so that they too have a bit of life and different colors um, and then did the same with the light i think i used soft light and hard light layers in this one not the overlay layers like i normally use um, to create both ambient light and then direct light i haven't yet but i soon will flatten the whole thing into a single layer which i will then start tightening i spend a lot of time in this particular drawing uh, as as in most drawings actually just tightening up my edges making sure that they read well crisply uh, and and make sense within the the overall composition and the drawing uh, of all the things that i do in a painting Tightening up the edges actually is probably one of the most tedious and the thing that I unfortunately have to do the most often. Um, but not everywhere. There are edges that I enjoy being loose and bold. So you can see the shapes, for example, the varying colored shapes on top of the umbrella. Um, I leave them as is because they, I think they read quite well. So, so that's all great. Like the shadow on the inside of the umbrella. It's not perfect. It doesn't need to be made any crisper. I then, once I've done all of that, I'm going to, you'll see a little bit later, I will start adding some reflected shadows and some reflected color. I will then enhance the outlines a little bit because, of course, it is a children's cartoon. It is a children's book, in theory, anyway. So um, it is, I enjoy that that more cartoony feel with the strong uh, f uh, outlines that make for quite readable shapes 
Incidentally, what you see me struggling with there right now is one of the reasons why I hate working with too many layers because I can never remember which layer I'm currently working on. I'm old and I trained on painting on just one canvas. I absolutely love layers, but I invariably end up painting on the long one uh, on the wrong ones. It's just a thing that happens. Once I've done all of that, um, and you'll see a little bit later, I then flatten the whole thing and then use um, layer masks um, to then create a little bit of a vignette and just enhance and tweak the overall light and shadows of the image to give us a uh, yeah to to help read the image I, I want people to focus on the important points so with the vignette I get to just soften the edges and I, and I subconsciously tell the viewer hey don't look at this stuff it's not that important look here this is the important stuff and that's more or less the process that I followed here. Oh, I forgot. Um, I actually I think, okay, so here I'm busy doing the, the outlines and then the reflected shadows of the reflected light just a little, just to make the, the, uh, the, the figure pop. But one of the things I didn't mention, uh, which obviously I will do soon, is I will create a color layer and actually enhance uh, enhance the color in certain areas. Like I mentioned in the last video, I love adding red light, uh, red color around the monster's eyes, and I will add a little bit of red to the knees and elbows and face of the kid, just to give it a little bit of life and pop. Even at this late stage of the drawing, I'm resisting the idea of tightening up too much you can see i'm still exploring and playing around often you'll well you'll see the facial expression changes quite a lot shape of the face and mouth i'm trying to find the best read without prescribing a necessary outcome now of course there are plenty of artists who are able to do that I just, uh, the, the artist that I most relate to and, my, and myself, of course, that just um, have a, what is called a reflexive approach. So we, we reflect on what is being produced and, and react to what is on the canvas. This, as I mentioned earlier on this video, allows us then to keep quite a, a fresh approach and a fresh look to the image. Another important element towards keeping your image fresh and vibrant and to keep your composition strong is to work from general to specific. In our minds, we have this idea that details are the important things, but they are not. They are the thing, they are the cherry on top of the cake. Uh, before you get to make your cake and make it look good by adding all the whipped cream designs and the little uh, sprinkles and cherries there is unfortunately a lot of baking a lot of mixing that needs to go into it and that base needs to be the focus at the end of the day if your uh, overall decoration is a failure but the cake is still delicious it's still a better cake than if you have perfect decoration on a cake that tastes terrible at this point, uh, to help me out, just so you can see what I'm doing, is I've added a colorized layer, which I've then flood filled with black. That gives me a black and white version of the image, which I then uh, use a color picker specifically to, to pick from the color layer, the, the, the original image. This allows me to almost paint blind and paint by tone. So I'm specifically removing color as an element from my palette and it allows me to focus much more on how we're reading the forms and how we're reading the objects without getting sidetracked by, by color and by uh, hues and, and variances. I find this technique very helpful to make sure that I get a clean read in my image. Back to uh, drawing from general to specific, it's um, very, I mean, it's not just useful in the overall picture, it's useful on how you approach anything.
If you had to draw a face, for example, it doesn't help you to start drawing the pores on a person's uh, cheek. You first want to start with an oval. Everybody knows how to draw an oval. Then you would draw a middle line, uh, a symmetrical line for where the, the, uh, the, the ridge of the forehead and the nose would go. And you know how to draw a line. And you would then break it up into smaller parts, you know, squares and circles and ovals, because we all know how to do that. And you work your way towards a final product, uh, towards a final image. If you get stuck into these tiny little details up front, you're going to ensure that you're not, you're, you're not, that, that their relationship is going to be uneven and difficult to follow. There are people who are able to draw from very specific details, but generally they are working from either you know, pre-prepared images or they have such a good mastery of, of uh, proportions and tones. And that's a fluke. It's not something that's very easy to train. If you are a beginner artist, if you are trying to find your way through the medium of art, uh, I mean into the world of art, do yourself a favor. Draw from general to specific. If you want to draw a, a landscape, let's start with something very simple, a, a vase of flowers. Um, don't start getting stuck in all the petals. Just get the basic proportions of that. I always tell people, imagine that you're getting a box, uh, a, a, a goodie delivered at your door. You're getting that object delivered to you. What box would it come in? What is its height versus its width? Its basic proportions. Once you have that basic box, then it becomes much easier to start subdividing it. Okay, what doesn't belong to the vase? What doesn't belong to the flowers? And start narrowing and eating into that shape. And you'll see that over time, those forms are going to become much more organic, much more realistic. But because you're developing the image from general to specific, because you're working, you're developing your shapes and your form, from general to specific, you're going to get a much better sense of, of uh, proportions and your drawing is going to read much more realistically. Side by side with the um, general to specific is an approach that I, I don't know how else to call it, but increasingly outward facing. So imagine that, um, let, let's take writing, for example. Writing begins with, um, you know, you can make a shopping note for yourself. So you're making a, a little shopping list uh, of what you're going to get at the supermarket. And you don't need to write out all the words. You don't need to write out all the quantities. You need to write out as few details as you need to. You can just write M for, uh, I don't know, <laughs> whatever it starts with, M for melon and B for bags because that's all you're getting at the supermarket. Those notes are for yourself. Now compare that to a novel, which is completely outward facing. Once it's published, the writer has very little uh, to do with it. It is completely at the, you know, that's the, the whole idea of the, the author is dead. It's completely outward facing. It becomes its own thing. Similarly, with an, with an artwork, the very first few marks, the beginnings of your drawing are internal, are inward facing. They are for you alone. You are the one constructing the composition, constructing the forms, constructing uh, the, the, the flow and rhythms and the, the interaction between the objects uh, and, and, and the elements in the, in, in the image, they are all for you. Nobody else needs to see that. And as the image progresses in its development, the lines and the marks and the forms become increasingly outward facing. They become less how you are reading it and less notes for finding your way through the image and much more about how a person is going to read that. And um, I find that if you keep that in mind, it helps you a lot in, in uh, so you don't care in your first few marks because it's just for you. And you only start slowly start thinking about the, the viewer towards the end of the painting. And again, it helps you keep that idea very fresh. It helps you keep the image very fresh. So if, um, if we look at writing, for example, there's an old uh, adage when it comes to writing that says writing is 10%, editing is 90%. 
Uh, it is very much the same with drawing, which is drawing is easy. Drawing is 10, 15 percent of your drawing. Editing your drawing is the long and lengthy process. And if you keep that in mind and keep your marks in a state of constant revision, a bit like the scientific approach, you want to always be cautious and conditional with your mark making and your decisions. It, um, it prevents you from committing too early to, um, to decisions that you may regret down the line with your image. So now we're down to the last few um, strokes of the, of the painting, uh, well, of the, of the drawing. I am now at this point, as you can see, I am using my uh, layer masks to uh, create a little bit of a vignette to push and pull the tones. I'm also doing a final little check of, um, of forms and, and, and shapes. Um, you may have noticed that I try and, and, and zoom in as little as possible. You want the overall readability of the image to stay with you. So here I've just created a little bit of a vignette just to sh um, shade just the corners, just to draw attention to the umbrella and the kid. And here is the final uh, version. As you can see, I have fixed up the dangling teeth and um, I've just fixed up a few other little images, uh, little artifacts and elements. Those of you who've managed to make it all the way to the end, which I don't think would be anyone except the absolutely most masochistic of you, thank you very much. And to everybody else, I cannot thank you enough for your support. And please come and join us over at uh, patreon.com forward slash Henry. That's Hen oh, oh no, Henry. Oh no, Henry with an I. See you next time.